So today, since we do have a, a, a panel discussion and questions and lots to get to, we're actually not gonna have time to do any introductions. So anybody who does feel compelled to introduce themselves or say hello to the group, um, feel free to use the, the chat. Any updates, things like that, that you wanted to share, chat's available. And it looks like we have all of our panelists on. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, I'm, I'm assuming, Jess, you are the what I see as RGO. No, no, that's uh, Walt listening in. Uh, Jess will be hopping on here uh, in a second. I was uh, just uh, listening. In. Oh, there she is. OK, great. Thanks, Walt. Wonderful, welcome, Jess. Hello, hello, it's nice to be here. Welcome, welcome. Hi, Matt. How are you? Good, how are you? I have no idea. Fair I'm enough, still, yeah. fair enough. Yeah, no, doing okay. Good, good to hear. Happy, good happy to see to you here. after probably about a year, or probably a year and a half or so. It's been a while, yeah, it's been a while. I was in exile in Australia for part of the summer, so they eventually kicked me out and I had to return, so. Did you have a good time? I did. It was very, very good visit. Was uh, it research-based? Yes. Okay. Um, it was a Fulbright uh, situation, so. Okay. Yeah. Matt, did you see any chestnut farms in Australia? I learned about how chestnut farming is happening in, in certain parts of Australia at the Great Lakes Expo. I didn't know about that. I did not see chestnuts there, but I did see quite a few of other, quite a few other range of, of uh, botanicals for sure. Yeah, nice. Very interesting. I suspect that chestnuts might be maybe in Victoria South. You know, I was, I was in Queensland. Okay. Uh, not too far from the meridian. It's Very interesting. Like degrees there right now. Interesting. Well, welcome everybody. It is noon. Um, Want to make sure that we stick to our time and, and appreciate everybody taking the time to join us today for our, our grower panel. Um, this is one of our organic farmer researcher network meetings. We meet every single month on the first Thursday of the month with different topics covered, sometimes panel discussions, sometimes sharing, sometimes formal presentations, but we invite everybody to join us for everything that we do. Um, I'm Denise Natoli Brooks, one of the coordinators right now for the organic farmer researcher network, along with um, Cassie Brown from OSU and Julia Barton from OFA. Um, today we've got a nice presentation that we put together as a panel, which may be the first panel we've done, to be honest. And we wanted to focus in on specialty crops and, and really um, highlight just the diversity of types of growing things we can grow, places we can grow, and then how many decisions we have to make. Um, and, and take time to find out how different growers make those decisions. This is a farmer-led group. Um, so although uh, Matt, Klein Hens, and I, your co-facilitators, have some prepared questions, um, we, want, we want everyone to participate. So the chat is available to drop questions, and we will get in as much as we can in a, in a brief hour. Um, for our presentation. This is being recorded. You should have gotten that message. I'm gonna drop in the chat, the information about where to find the recording. Um, it will come up on the OSU Offer YouTube channel and past presentations and meetings of this group are also on that site. So I'll drop that information in the chat. So if you wanna share it with others or rewatch this, you'll have the opportunity to do so. 
Um, we've got a lot planned for this group, not just today, but going forward in 2023. We've got our next meeting next first Thursday is February 2nd. Also, we've got some interesting workshops I wanted to make sure everybody knew about um, right away. So we are doing a workshop in February on the 16th of February. It's a DIY on farm research workshop. So we'll actually get to meet in person as opposed to the virtual space we've been in. Um, and, and that one is set up as, as a, a day, it's 10 to four, um, that we can really talk about what are the questions we have and how do we then turn them into research projects um, and maybe make some of those connections with each other when we have similar questions. So I will drop information about both of those events in the chat as well. Um, I do wanna highlight that that DIY on-farm research workshop um, is at no cost, which is wonderful. Lunch is being covered. Um, and for underrepresented farmers, there is a stipend available through Central State University for costs associated with participating. So I'll drop that information in the chat, but I do wanna leave us as much time as possible for our panel discussion because we all have different motivations for our seed selection, um, but sometimes when we hear from each other, we get good ideas, new things to consider. Uh, and we really wanna have that open and honest discussion today. So I'm gonna turn it over to Matt to introduce our panelists and get us started. Uh, thank you very much, Denise, and thank you to uh, everyone who's joined us today. Everyone responsible for the network um, is well aware of how many um, how much competition there is for your time as uh, guests joining us, uh, whether live here or by the recording. So we really appreciate your uh, curiosity at the very least about the network and also about this particular uh, topic, which is uh, the selection of varieties and specialty crop um, operations. And as Denise mentioned, it is very much farmer led. The network is very much farmer led, farmer oriented, farmer focused, and Perhaps some of the best work that we can do as uh, network coordinators would be to make it possible for uh, folks who join in this conversation to hear from other farmers, right? And um, and other folks who are in the in the uh, food uh, farming fiber energy value chains, if you will. So today we're very pleased and very lucky to have three folks who will share their points of view and their experiences specific to the topic of variety selection. I will um, um, be honored to share their names and just their affiliations with you. But after I've done that, we'd like to hear uh, for a brief minute from each of them, uh, whatever they'd like to add about their operation and, and their point of view. So uh, we have three panelists today and their names are Dana Hilfinger of Roots, Fruits and Shoots Farm in, in Johnstown, Ohio. Uh, we also have Jess Hudson uh, from the Richland Grow Op. And we have Ben Jackal from Miles Creek Farm, uh, Mile Creek Farm in New Lebanon. And so, uh, Dana, if you wouldn't mind being first, to, if you'd like to just add a minute or so of description about your operation, and uh, uh, before we turn to the to the open question and answer time regarding variety selection. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. I'm Dana Hilfinger. I think I know many of you. Um, I uh, am both a farmer and then I also am the territory representative for Johnny's for Johnny Selected Seeds for Ohio, Michigan and Indiana. Um, but my farm in particular, as Matt said, is called Roots, Fruits and Shoots, uh, located just outside Columbus in Johnstown, Ohio. I rent three acres um, uh, there and grow about a half acre of raspberries and an uh, acre and a half of other produce, mostly vegetables um, that I market during kind of what's usually considered the traditional off season of fall, winter, and early spring. Um, and then I do about an acre or so of cover crop um, at any given time uh, on the farm. And um, I guess just a little bit about where I'm selling, if that sounds appropriate at this point. Um, uh, let's, uh, if it's okay, let's uh, want... pull that into the into the conversation because cool. uh, that'll probably dovetail very nicely with some of the questions. Um, not, okay. not not to cut you off, but um, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, Jess, please. Jess, you're muted. 
Yep. Sorry. Hi, everybody. I'm Jess Hudson. Um, I am the aggregation manager and um, uh, slash crop planner for Richland Grow Up. Um, and I am formerly a farmer um, under OSU Mansfield, uh, trained under Dana. Um, at, our, at the time, she was our trainer through uh, FFAR. Uh, Matt was also one of um, the the blessed uh, folks that got to assist in our training process and taught us some uh, neat little you know tricks here and there. Um, but other than that, we just basically consist of about eight micro farms. Essentially, is what we're calling them. They're about five thousand square feet um, of growing space each farm. Um, this has been our twenty twenty two was our first year as a co op. Uh, solely by ourselves. So it was an interesting experience as I jumped from farmer to um, the aggregation, the, the keeping track of farmers, um, crop planning, all that stuff. Um, and then just real quick, like we do, we sell to wholesale retail, we do direct consumer sales, um, try to try to hit it all. So Looks like Ben, you're next. Introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Ben Jakeley, and I, my wife Emily, and I uh, own and operate Mile Creek Farm, uh, which is outside of Dayton, Ohio. And um, we have been farming here since about 2007. Uh, the whole farm is about right around 30 acres. We grow 12 to 15 acres of vegetables um, each year. Um, and with the remainder of the ground in cover crops. Um, and we market those through a CSA, uh, sell at a farmer's market, and then do some wholesale uh, distribution too. And I'm sure more will come out answering the questions, so. Sure, yes, as I turn it back to, to Denise, uh, it is important to note that these three folks plus all of the experience um, in the conversation today, right now, just as, uh, as, uh, as guests, if you will, uh, the Hollywood Squares array of, of names and, and or faces um, will definitely make this a lively and I think a very informative conversation. Um, we're gonna definitely rely on, on Dana and Jess and Ben for, for their specific input, given the diversity of the operations that you just heard about, uh, but we have more, more uh, present in the, in the room as well. Um, but Denise and I are here to, to facilitate the conversation and uh, we do have some prepared questions, but we would very much enjoy having questions coming from the floor, if you will. And those can be supplied uh, definitely in the chat, which I'll monitor um, and contribute to, uh, to kind of the spoken questions as needed, but uh, I'll turn it over to Denise. Thanks, Matt. I'm gonna throw the first question out to Jess. Um, and Jess, I was hoping you could tell us about how you, um, as a co-op, make decisions about what you what you have the skills to grow, what you have the space to grow, um, but then also balancing that with what the customers demand from you. Um, so decisions on what we grow is kind of a paired decision. Um, realistically, I'm the one that makes said decisions um, in that regards because I'm the one that talks to the customers on a regular basis. Um, so with that being said, we have a high-end restaurant that we have sold to since Dana was on with us. Um, and we kind of base what decisions we make in regards to what we plan on the entire year because that's what we do is we plan the entire year out this restaurant. Um, so that we have, you know, an idea of what they want because they are 50% of our sales in that regards. So, you know, we kind of obviously want to balance it around one of them. Um, but then we also mix it with our growing capabilities. Like, yes, we have high tunnels. Um, yes, we do. Dana taught us, you know, the, the fall winter growing, um, so on and so forth. So we make those decisions. And as I have stepped into this position, cause I, you know, obviously said I had the farmer experience. And now that I've stepped into this position of the marketing experience and um, all of that, it's <clears throat> come to, to light, um, you know, just the different things that you don't see as the farmer because you're just, you're just doing that work. Um, but with that, it's 
trying to figure out so going from our high end buyer seeing what we've done over this last year as a company you know just by ourselves as a co-op i have been able to from my experience as a farmer and from this last year kind of um corral direct what crops i know that we can we can put out um but then there's you know the crops there's certain crops that i have seen us fail on time after time doesn't matter the season it just it it doesn't fit for our area um so we just kind of work around those things and we we just more directly go to the stuff that you know that i've seen through our experiences that we we do really well um and it you know fuses in with with the, our high end buyer and then at that point it's like i branch out and i start to hit my wholesalers and i start to hit my retailers because like i said i have the entire year planned out so you know, with that being said, I can be uh, ahead of the game to make sure that what we are, what we are going to be putting out there, what we are putting in the ground is in fact going to sell come, um, you know, it's time. So that's kind of, you know, it, it's been a trial and error process for obviously figuring out what we can grow because we're in Mansfield, Ohio, for the most part. So we have the varying weather of the, the Great Lakes and we have, you know, just all of that um so it's you know matt matt knows too it's you know not too far there up in worcester it, it's we've just got interesting weather so um that's kind of how i have made the decisions that i've had um and we had you know we had a good first year it was it was productive um you know didn't hit our marks necessarily but there was a lot of there's a lot of changes a lot of variables that come into play with that as well so but that's, you know, that's essentially how I figure out and how I plan my year going forward. And I usually, you know, I have my year planned out six months. So I'll have next year 24 planned out by June. Um, and it's at that point, it's just a matter of, of selling it, um, you know, knowing in advance. So that's kind of how we've chosen our seed, you know, what we're going to grow um, and the volumes and what our capabilities are for our area has been the biggest probably feat. But it's been good. It's been good. So that's how we figure it. That's how we do it. Uh, so Ben, um, as I listened to Jess, quite a few things came to mind, but one of the most, uh, I think, persistent ones was the use of information, wherever that might be coming from. Um, and certainly the use of good, good seed and, you know, um, good seed and information. Um, now we 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 do have at least one seed company representative on the on the call today, so not uh, not to not to create uh, unwanted um, you know uh, concerns, but I'm I'm curious about what information you use to decide you know what varieties you need and how do you decide where to source that seed from. Um, the seed business is a very diverse one. Obviously, it's a it's a global one. And it's a very competitive one, and um, lots of people vying for the attention of farmers like yourself. Uh, oftentimes, with websites or books or any number of uh, ways that they communicate. So, um, I'm curious about what information you you rely on, and how you decide what companies to work with uh, in that in that respect. Yeah, uh, certainly. Well, I think I can um, I can answer the the companies that uh, probably. 75% or 80% of our seed comes from either Johnny's or Osborne. Um, those have been the seed companies that we've relied on most. And uh, probably almost all of the remainder comes from uh, Seedway. Um, so, and the, just historically, those are the companies that we have found to be the most reliable in terms of, uh, you know, getting the varieties that we um, are looking for and getting the, you know, having competitive prices and having, you know, shipping and all that kind of logistic stuff work out um, as easily enough uh, with them. Um, in terms of getting the information about which seed companies to rely on, um, we I mean, it's been through trial and error. Um, you know, I've, I've definitely and and just through you know sort of uh, networks of other farmers that we um, work with, I've worked with uh, a, a couple of other larger growers through the uh, cooperative uh, grow, 
Um, and so, you know, when by working with other farmers who are kind of growing at the same or larger scales than you are um, finding out where they're sourcing their seed from, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of been how I've determined it. And uh, I, I actually really like interacting with um, the seed reps at the conferences and so on and so forth. Um, you know, Dana has been out to our farm and um, uh, I've talked to, well, she's no longer there, I guess, or Rebecca from um, Osborne um, at a couple conferences and, and always have uh, really good information from them because, you know, the, we've, we've been doing this for long enough that we have varieties, specific varieties that we're looking for. Um, and, you know, I find personally, um, I find as an organic farmer, I tend to be looking for varieties short day, uh, or, or varieties that come ready in the, you know, in the the, the sort of fewest number of days. Um, it's just a sort of general thing. If I'm if I'm going to be trying a new variety of something, I tend to prioritize those because I feel like um, I feel like there's a you know the thing that we we are we are the the least equipped to deal with as organic farmers. A lot of times there is disease. Um, and there's just not a lot you can do once, uh, once some of those diseases are begin to be established. And I feel like a lot of diseases really start to, you know, set in as, as plants kind of, uh, turn from vegetative to, you know, fruit producing or, or, uh, maturing in that way. And so that days to days to maturity is, is something that we look at a lot. Um, and then, Seed reps are generally pretty helpful, like in terms of parentage and things like that. Um, we've been growing Bolero carrots for a number of years, and I know there are some improved varieties of that um, that have been showing up in the last couple of years. But being able to to talk to, like, say, the seed seed reps and and hear that the new varieties are kind of have that same disease resistance and you know seedling vigor or whatever from of of those uh, you know varieties that we already know is kind of, you know, what we're, what we're really, um, really looking for. So I think that that's, um, I think that kind of sums it up. I'm happy to answer any other questions that anybody might have on those topics. Yeah, I just want to remind folks that the chat is available to drop a question in there and then that, that can be conveyed to, you know, the panelists, but also I'll just take a break and hit a pause and, and ask if anyone does have a follow-up question for Ben um, at this point. I don't want to be selfish. I do have one quick one, very quick one, and then we need to turn back to Denise. Um, it sounds, what I heard you say is that you select the, the companies that you currently work with, you've come to work with through trial and error and the advice of other growers. And that the input from um, those seed reps and some select growers are, is very important to your selection of the actual varieties. Uh, do I understand that correctly? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there there are a few varieties that are available only from, you know, that we have relied on for a number of years that are only available from certain companies. And so, you know, we'll always order from those varieties from those companies. And, um, and, and yeah, I would say that the, the best way that we can get kind of like the collective... I, you, you know, every year it's so difficult to tell if the reason that you're having an issue with a seed is, you know... Uh, is whether or not it's like seed related or whether or not it's cultural um, and so on and so forth. Um, so I think that relying on kind of other growers um, who you know are, are, you know, putting enough fertility out there, keeping the fields relatively weed free and so on and so forth and sort of reducing the, 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 the sort of exterior influence, influences that might, you know, drive down yield or so on and so forth. Um, you know, using kind of like the reviews of those that, you know, that kind of uh, type of grower, like, um, you know, you, we've kind of come to rely on and trust like those um, particular seed companies the, the most. Have you, um, before we move to Denise, have you engaged in a lot of trialing, perhaps on a small scale of potentially either new varieties or potential new varieties with the seed companies or others that you know might might be improved varieties that would replace that one that you have come to rely on very heavily. 
Yeah, we, well, we do trials ourselves. I mean, we're as certified organic, we're always looking for organic varieties of seeds. And a lot of times those will run those as like a, a, a trial sort of amount, just a little bit smaller amount than we would like, you know, instead of just, you know, wholeheartedly relying on it. Um, we, uh, we haven't worked directly with seed companies, but I, some of our you know, some of the other people who we work with and, and growers around us have. And so we've kind of like, you know, again, that's a, a, just another plug that I'll make for, you know, talking to your neighbors and, and others um, as much as possible, because, um, you know, like, uh, um, you know, a lot of times they'll have that kind of information about, you know, having done side-by-side -side trials. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, Dan. In this group, I think we're in a mindset of thinking research. How can we turn this into research? What have we researched? What on-farm research has happened? So even as I listen to the conversation, uh, the wheels are turning. I'm like, hmm, is there a research question in here? How can we take what, say, Ben's doing and do that on multiple farms? And then that's, that's kind of like the, the idea behind this group, too, is, is how do we take our research and share it as well? Because Research can benefit ourselves, but it benefits all of us if we if we share it and we you know amplify it and all that. So um, I encourage you all to think of those research questions too, or what you're wondering about as you listen to answers. Um, I'm going to throw the next question out to Dana, and Dana, I'm wondering if you could talk about how you make decisions about selling um, and producing large volumes that last throughout the season seasons um, and then you know comparing that to what's going to be really sellable what's going to be really pretty and draw in those consumers yeah sure um, well I think in some ways my like the sweet spot would be that it's not that it like checks both boxes for both categories right so you could both produce it in a pretty large quantity and it's pretty sellable um, in general my approach approach for you know for crop planning is that like when I'm putting together a plan for the year deciding to put in a half acre of berries um, or whatever it is that you know I have the market kind of already lined up for whatever I'm growing um, you know sometimes that's I know I'm going to sell it at the farmer's market um, you know and so there's a risk there that it's not you know necessarily going to be sold but you know, I, I have kind of the outlet in mind um, and I have a hopefully a good idea that it would be, um, you know, it would, it would at least sell the quantity that I'm growing so that I'm not left over or left with a lot left over. Um, I think in general, like my strategy though, for like what I'm producing and when has been, you know, before I started the farm, I had the benefit of managing another farm in the area and was pretty familiar with the market um, in central Ohio. And so kind of saw where there were gaps, saw that like, you know, there was hardly any winter production um, in fall, winter, early spring production, saw that there weren't many people doing fruit, especially fruit early in the season at a market. Um, and growing it organically. Um, so saw opportunities there to be able to grow those crops uh, in quantity and started out kind of with, you know, smaller num amounts of them and then grew that as those initial observations proved to be true or shifted away if it turns out that, you know, there wasn't quite as much of a market for something as I thought. So, um, but I think like in any given season, you know, my crop plan like stays relatively the same, um, you know, or it kind of evolves based on what uh, wholesale customers or farmers market customers are looking for or have asked for. But in general, I, you know, I'm growing probably about like 85 to 90% of what I'm growing are things that I have a, like, you know, I'm pretty confident that I can sell um, and that I've had experience with in the past and that I'm comfortable growing. And then I'm usually trying to add in about, you know, 10 to 15% of uh, experimenting with new varieties, um, or maybe it's a new crop or something. Um, but that kind of ratio is about what I try to keep it at so that I'm, you know, not going too far down the path of experimenting with everything um, and not being able to 
kind of manage those different trials and have good observations or have good management practices over those different crops. So I, does that kind of answer the question, Denise, or did, did you have any follow-up for that? I think that that's a good summary, and I like that um, that idea of having a certain percentage that you're like, this is where I can play around a little bit, but here's what I need to really know that I can sell. Do you have an example of something that you tried and you were like, oh, that's not actually what is needed, or something that you were asked to grow that you're like, huh, oh, maybe I could do that. Yeah, yeah. So generally, um, I had been kind of like creeping back down the path of growing, starting to like add in more vegetables to my summer production, which was not initially the point of what I was trying to do and was reminded of that this year, when I got a contract to grow a lot of collard greens, which was great. Um, and we were able to do it. And it was wonderful. But it ended up kind of taking away a lot of our attention from um, you know, the, some of those other fruit crops in the summer that really do kind of require a lot of our, pretty much all of our attention, you know, for at least a couple of months or so in the summer months. So that wasn't something that was a new crop necessarily, but was a like market that I think we decided, even though we could, you know, get a contract for that and grow it profitably, um, it meant that it sacrificed, you know, our ability to focus on these other crops that are also profitable and very sellable and kind of distracted us. Um, so ended up not really maybe being being worth it um, in that case. So that like, I mean, that's one that's not like a, a crazy unique crop. Um, I think there's been other examples where <laughs> I think one year I grew kaolettes um, and <laughs> did not find a market for that at all uh so that you know dropped off the list at one point but um uh it yeah it you know it can be kind of for different reasons so we're roughly 30 minutes into a conversation about variety selection and i think we spent a lot of time rightfully so talking about crops as much as anything and to my ear if i'm correct i've heard only that i've heard the name of only one specific variety bolero carrot um, so if I'd like to make a quick observation, um, Atlantic potato variety is still one of the most popular potato varieties, especially for the chipping market, but it is also well regarded or well known as well below the capacity of other superior varieties. Why does it continue to get grown? It never fails. It rarely fails. Okay. So the question I would have for all of our guests, Jess, Ben, and Dana, is having worked with so many people um, in different capacities whose focus is introducing better germplasm, better varieties to growers, how do you balance the question of, okay, I'm familiar with Bolero carrot or whatever variety you wanna think about, but to Dana's point, like introducing 15, you know, keeping room for experimentation, how do you balance the predictability of the variety that you know with the possibility that it actually could be not as good as one that is new, but unproven to you? How do you manage that? And just a free for all, uh, Dana, Ben, and Jess, or others. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to to jump into that. I think I think the main thing, um, you know, is that it would really depend. It really depends on, you know, we have sort of crops that are are we grow at a much larger scale for our, um, uh, you know, for kind of like the wholesale market versus like the sort of the CSA level crops. So another one is, you know, we've been growing American Dream sweet corn for a number of years and um, you know, talking to people, reps at the last conference, you know, there were some recommendations, I think, for Troubadour, you know, ahead of the American dream. And so, you know, I'm really like very nervous to try it out. But at the same time, um, you know, I, 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 I have definitely seen the, you know, improvements that, uh, you know, in, 
in newer newer varieties. So I think that there's there is, I think that it, um, like I say, I mean the 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 biggest issue for us is a lot of times you know we're looking for, we have some sort of secondary characteristic like the days to maturity or um, like the with the sweet corn like the you know growing all like the super sweets or whatever it is the the right you know, genetically compatible varieties of sweet corn, you know, so that there, there are all these other sorts of, you know, things like we grow two, two varieties of sweet corn um, and we do them in succession so that we, you know, have two maturity dates and it really limits like the possibility of us trying out different varieties because we, you know, we need that certain separation between the two maturity dates, you know, in order for it to work in our systems, um, you know, uh, with uh, like with sweet potatoes, that's another one uh, that I have found really interesting this past year because we've grown Orleans and Bayou Bell for a number of years. And we started growing Bayou Bell at the recommendation, you know, of the company that we had been, or farm that we've been purchasing these from, you know, that they were like, a was an improved genetic variety. Um, and we indeed did get, you know, twice the yield on that usually versus like Orleans, but this past season, we actually had the Orleans out yielded the Bayou Bells. Um, and so now we're very confused about, you know, which, which variety to like kind of scale back on or anything like that. So I think that, you know, I think that, um, uh, I think that it's really like, you know, bringing those other bringing those other varieties in, you know, on the crops that where you're really going to want to make sure you're getting the highest yield. Um, again, I, I, I did some research, um, you know, on a return on investment for doing a compost tea thing. And I think that the, the, the basic, basically like the, you know, if you're experimenting, you know, if you really want to experiment with the new genetics um, in order to get the absolute highest yield, it makes the most sense to do that with the crops, you know, that you are trying to push the most of them out into the market on. And so, um, you know, it's like if, if we're selling 20,000 pounds of sweet potatoes, you know, we really want to make sure that we are planting the crops that are going to give us the highest yield potential. Um, so that's how I would make the determination about where to make my experiments. Jess or Dana? Well, I think also maybe if I like kind of put on the seed rep hat a little bit and just what I've learned from working at Johnny's over the last year is that, you know, I think Ben's right. Like it can really depend on the crop that we're talking about, you know, how much experimentation you might want to do. So like spinach would be one where I would always recommend to a grower and I grow myself multiple varieties of spinach because you might want downy mildew resistance that's covering a variety of races because you don't know what race is going to be an issue in a given year. And then also the spinach seed market is driven by California. And so oftentimes spinach varieties are only around for a couple of years and then they're gone because they don't meet the standards for California growers. So don't get too attached to any spinach variety. Um, that's not the case you know, for every type of crop. There's a lot of variation kind of depending on the disease pressure. But um, I, I think in general, it is you know, certainly a good idea for those crops that you see a lot of cycling through of varieties to always be putting in newer varieties into your crop plan to be able to test um, what, uh, you know, how they're gonna do in your system. So I'm going to have to say that I'm probably a little spoiled um, in regards to the opportunities of being able to play around a little bit more with seed selection and seed varieties. Um, and, you know, a lot of that has to do with um, the amount of growing space that we kind of like the farmers seal off for me isn't necessarily all of their growing space. Um, so when I do have like a new variety that, you know, and I'm, I'm a diehard Bolero too, so I have to, you know, it's, it's been hard to, to branch off that, but I've, you know, we've tried a few, you know, newer ones, um, but, you know, we, we kind of have that ability. So, you know, for me, I'm a little more spoiled and I can't say it's necessarily, you know, um, income-based or anything like that. I just have a little 
extra space that's not in my 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 planning um that when something you know if i have our one of our buyers is like hey we want a purple carrot and i'm like okay do you have nope just and so you know i'll try a deep purple all the way through or i'll try like the dragons i tried this year which has got the the nice orange center um so on and so forth so um uh, you know i'm a little i have a little more leeway um with with my cooperative um on top of the fact the necic urban farm um you know has has well they have my osu high tunnel now <clears throat> but um they have extra space as well because they are still also kind of a, a research site so definitely interesting to hear um just those considerations when you are looking at your 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 trialing your your own research taking a chance and taking a risk too right it's a lot about how much risk can i take um and and we have to we always have to weigh that um and i i think too kind of your stories are what help us then decide when we choose our own seeds where we might want to take some of those risks and try things too which is why we're having this conversation um I am curious to know with some of those those trials, those risks that you took, variety selection and all that, um, a, a, just a question about maybe some of what those those biggest failures and successes have been with your variety selection. Um, and then more importantly, like how has that changed your decision making over time? Um, and this is for everybody, whoever wants to take that one first. So just kind of hitting on biggest failures and successes related to your selection. And, and I, how that I can change. jump on that real quick. Um, that's actually one of the things I wrote down. And believe it or not, my biggest failure was not paying attention to the variety uh, disease resistance. Um, that was ultimately my biggest uh-oh. Um, it was reflected all across all of my farms. Um, because everybody had had the same variety as a cherry variety, um, but it was a newer variety and I, you know, that it didn't affect the entirety of, of our mix, like it wasn't every single plant, but every single farm experienced um, an issue with, you know, said cherry variety. Um, that was, I mean, that was my, my biggest, biggest failure. I don't really have any huge successes. Um, Johnny's kind of, we're, we're a Johnny's fan too. So um, we don't outsource past Johnny's very often unless it's a variety I can't get a hold of. So don't really have huge success stories, but I did have that one failure that, you know, definitely um, paying attention to the, the disease resistance. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say that we, over the years, I mean, the longer I think about it, the more failures <laughs> come to mind. <laughs> there, there are there are a lot of them. Uh, I remember, I mean, years back, there was a while there where you couldn't get winter bore uh, kale seed, and so we tried some of the other ones from high mowing and various places, and and it was just terrible. Um, and so we would hoard that for a little while, and now. You know, now it seems like that that supply is fine, but um, I, you know, it's it's hard for me to trust any other of the kale seed, you know, varieties than than winter boar. Um, you know, I guess uh, potatoes are another one. You know, we we've um, we really like uh, we've we've relied on Kennebec, which is another one of those tried and true varieties um, for a long time. You know, we've had one. I think one year wasn't available. So, you know, substituted some like uh, superior, I think. And it was, you know, it was not at all good for, you know, our, you know, growing systems. Um, and, but then this past year, we uh, actually substituted out to uh, Reba and Elba. Um, and those were, those were fine, um, comparable uh, to, to Kennebec. So, um, you know, I think it kind of goes both ways. I think there's always, like, it's always, um, you know, we're always very nervous. I mentioned the Bayou Bell, which we trialed and, and, and had a lot of good results with, um, you know, I, one of our, you know, co-op friends has had really good results with Covington, but uh, sweet potatoes, but we've never had 
any success with uh, with Covington. Um, so I'm not really, you know, it's it's it's, it's kind of, um, you know, it's a, it's definitely very, you know, hit or miss on various farms. I'm trying to think of uh, other ones, and I I mean, yeah, so. And I guess another one that's always frustrating to me is that we're always looking for because we we don't grow anything in high uh, high tunnels, and so you know tomatoes are kind of the this whole um, uh, heirloom tomato market is is kind of you know always we we do a certain amount of it for our CSA, but it's not a big you know we try to put as little effort into it as possible, and so you know we um, we found the the sort of hybrid heirlooms to be a, a good thing, and the the chef's choice orange are a great tomato. Um, the chef's choice, everything else are terrible. Um, so they're like the same, you know, general parent lineage or whatever, but uh, for whatever reason, the chef's choice black, um, I guess, I think that one was the particular one that we tried. Um, and we had somebody working for us who had worked on farms who tried other ones, you know, nothing except for the chef's choice orange uh, seems to be, um, you know, really reliable along those lines of of things. So it's it's kind of difficult because you can find something that that's really that you really feel like is going to work, but it turns out that it's still a complete failure. So <laughs> yeah, I have um I have one example from raspberries that when I first put in a the quarter acre of berries in my first year, I did three different varieties and um, then was planning to kind of expand based on observations of which ones were doing the best and um, had Prelude, Boyne, and Killarney all as early season berries that, you know, are producing, you know, second week of June or so until mid-July. Um, and, uh, you know, had loved, um, you know, I think all of them did pretty well in terms of yield, but, you know, was like really blown away by Boeing's flavor compared to the other two. Um, and so almost after, you know, like two years of doing that, almost went ahead and just pulled the trigger on like putting another quarter acre almost of Boeing. But then luckily did not do that and found, you know, kind of quickly that Boeing also seemed to be the most, um, uh, susceptible to some diseases and the berry quality really went downhill um, after the after the second year um, so we uh, thankfully maybe kind of avoided planting a whole lot of another variety that um, ended up not really having that kind of staying power so that's just I guess one thing with perennial crops in particular it can be kind of challenging to judge them in the first, you know, year or two, um, depending on the crop. So um, that's one, uh, uh, you know, an almost big failure. Um, the other, I guess, one of the successes I have, I, I don't know if I mentioned this before. I grow melons in tunnels, um, which maybe is a bit unusual. Um, if for an early spring or for an early summer melon crop, so I plant them in April in the tunnels, which I'm mostly using for fall, winter, spring production. Um, but the melons kind of fit that summer slot. Uh, so I plant them in there in April and harvest um, starting the second week of June, usually, and it kind of fits in with around the same time as when I'm taking raspberries to the market. Uh, and um, I've had some great successes with trialing out some different melon varieties. They're trellised in the tunnel. Um, I'm usually growing some of the smaller uh, Charente and other, um, you know, under three pound varieties that don't really require support uh, beyond the, uh, the netting. Um, and I had a great success this year with one that um, really kind of blew me away, both in terms of its powdery mildew resistance and then also its uh, um, productivity over a long period of time, which can be an issue with with certain cantaloupe varieties. So um, Arava was the one that I found, which is a um, Gallia type melon. So a, a tropical melon kind of has like the cross between a honeydew and a cantaloupe, but worked really well in that system, was really productive, a little bit larger, um, but still was uh, able to be supported by the trellises. And um, 
just kind of happened because I was trying to add in, you know, just again, was that part of that like 15% or so experimentation um, that that turned out pretty well. So, and a lot of that again was, you know, was, came down to disease, a better disease package than some of the other ones. So, um, yeah. So we're approaching um, the top of the hour, which is uh, and, uh, it's our commitment to end on time because we realize that um, people's time is very, very precious. Um, this conversation has been excellent. I think there's uh, it's, a, it's a great example of a conversation that begets many more conversations. And uh, embedded within all of the comments that we've heard, I think are, are excellent topics for follow-up. Um, there are additional examples in the chat so for example, uh, Sam asked about cover crop selection. I just placed one example of resource of a resource that I, I've come to rely on fairly heavily. Um, it is a product of the Midwest Cover Crops Council, which is a multi-institution and very farmer um, engaged process for developing resources to assist people in selecting cover crops, which is somewhat, somewhat um, obviously related to what we're talking about here today, but not necessarily the focus, um, crops versus varieties and, and, uh, and the cash crops specifically was the focus today. But Sam and others who are interested in cover crop, cover crop selection, regardless of the reason, I would encourage you to consider the Midwest Cover Crops Handbook, uh, the Midwest Cover Crops uh, Council online decision support tool, which I haven't yet put a, a, um, a, uh, a URL for in the chat, but it's a, you can find it very easily with a with a simple Google search, uh, and and of course, it, um, farmer other farmers are um, uh, a great resource. I will also add that there is for those who would like uh, uh, for me to to follow up with me on this. Um, there is a uh, a network called the Idea Farm Network. It is a, an organic it is a network of organic farmers throughout the Midwest, Upper Midwest especially. And it's an exceptionally active one. Most of the business is conducted by email. And during the um, uh, growing months, uh, there are spontaneous uh, meetings at various farms around Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and so on, Wisconsin, Minnesota. My point in this is that you're, welcome, you're probably very welcome to join that network and that listserv. It is mostly about agronomy, but not exclusively. And um, I, I personally have learned a lot through that network, um, being the vegetable guy that I am, but uh, I've learned to listen, uh, you know, listen to him very carefully. So that's another resource I'd be glad to share um, um, uh, if, if you're interested. Um, we're looking at, again, close to the top of the hour. We would like to fit another, another big question in for our three panelists. And uh, from, the, from the list of many uh, that we came to the conversation with, and we apologize if we can't get to all the all the ones that would interest you most. But the one question that we, we might end with, unless there's a follow-up, is the top three recommendations that our panelists would offer to another grower um, with who is also facing their own set of conundra and you know questions about variety selection. Um, how we've heard a little bit about how everyone goes about it, how the three of you go about it, and what you've relied on. But if you've left anything out that you would like to specifically emphasize as a recommendation, um, or perhaps a really, really important question that this network and others could, could address, uh, please include that as well. So um, any takers for, that, no, takers for that question? I can just jump in really quickly. And I, I'd, I'd say it's, it's a little bit more of a general one and I alluded to it earlier, but I would say that you know, whenever, like if you have a variety that you really want to know about, um, want a recommendation on a variety, like the, the, the course that, that I've already uh, always done is like, say, try to find somebody who is growing it on a larger scale than you are and uh, try to find out what variety it is that they are growing. Um, because if somebody's relying on that crop for, you know, their commercial success, they're much more likely to have uh, appropriate experience, you know, for more. And
Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, trying to find someone who's growing it at, you know, if you're interested in a variety, trying to find someone who's growing it at scale. Um, uh, you know, we, so at Johnny's, you know, we variety trial everything that's in our catalog um, at, in Maine, but, you know, that's not necessarily the same conditions that you're experiencing in the Midwest. So, um, you know, we try to do more regional trials uh, and, you know, part of my job is kind of collecting a lot of just the information and feedback from growers on different varieties. But, um, you know, so I, you know, I can be a resource in that way if you, if you have questions, but I would say the you know, the best thing would be to find another grower that's growing it commercially um, to be able to talk to them as well about it. Um, I just, I also, I just saw in the chat, and so I just, I didn't want to like go off too much, but someone asked about climate change and how it influenced crop and variety selections too. And I'll say the biggest area where I've seen like a, um, that I've, uh, you know, the biggest stressors that I see is from heat mostly. And uh, for the fruiting crops that I'm growing in the summer that the that warm nighttime temperatures can be a challenge. Um, so for like a lot of the fruiting crops, so currently I'm growing melons, but historically I've grown tomatoes and peppers um, in tunnels before. So, you know, looking for things that are um, going to not drop blossoms as quickly uh, um, or at a, a lower heat, you know, that are pretty tolerant in that regard um, are, you know, some of the things that I'm looking for. But, you know, I think in general, climate change just kind of opens the opportunity for a lot more disease pressure in general <laughs> as things kind of warm. So, um, you know, that disease package also is, is something that I kind of look out for. I just didn't want that question to be missed, so. I was actually going to comment the same or on the same yeah. line, Dana, because I saw that too. And it was, you know, it, it does depend on, you know, there are certain crops like the winter boar, like the black magic, like, you know, you were talking, Dana was talking about like the summer crops and, you know, my mind, because we're in Ohio. So, you know, we have all four seasons potentially in one day. So, you know, my mind then flips to right now we're in the, <clears throat> the cold. We've got, you've had some nasty cold um, that's come through and, you know, the same thing applies though, like in that regards, it's knowing, you know, knowing necess necessarily the, the disease, but I see more or less whether you know that variety is hardy. So like the, like I said, the winter board kale, the black magic kale, the bolero carrots, like those are, those have been consistent for us. Um, you know, even, uh, most of the beets like touchstone or, um, boulders, um, most of those are, have been clutch um, fall winter crops for us because they are durable, cold, cold climate crops. Um, you know, we might get a little tip burn. We did from the, the extremely low temps that we had, we had a little tip burn. Um, but you know, it's again, just knowing your varieties and knowing their tolerance, um, you know, and how far they can be pushed, um, which ultimately, you know, goes back to what Ben said, what Dana said and finding another grower that's, that's grown it. I would also make just a really quick, because you're saying top three varieties, and we've talked about a lot of these like really high performing, really great varieties and everything like that. We do a lot of uh, like a cut salad mix for our CSA, which is um, like we put it in the CSA boxes. We don't wholesale it. You know, it's not a specialty item by any means. We have absolutely relied on, you know, new red fire lettuce and Bergam's green. They are uh, inexpensive seed. We can get them pelleted. Um, and I'm pretty sure they're both available organically. Um, and it allows us to grow um, a very consistent, or, you know, relatively consistent lettuce mix without having a whole bunch of money tied up in, you know, seed costs and a lot of worries. So sometimes the variety choices are not based on your particular market and everything like that, like what you might be your all-star varieties are not necessarily only tied to, you know, how well they perform, but, you know, sometimes it's, it's the, you know, it's the, like the, just the variety that's been around for a long time and the, the, um, the cost of affordability of the seed. Excellent. Thank you all for your comments. I want that and for, um, seeing comments in the chat too and, and responding to them. Um, you know, it's three minutes to noon or one. We knew that 
we would start a conversation and then we would see where it went and possibly even have more conversations based on what we we started to talk about on this one to you know delve further into some topics and we were expecting that um, I, I do want to acknowledge that Doug threw a question in the chat um, about land grant resources that have been helpful that you know we're not going to have time for right now but it's a great question um, and and we talked about talking to other farmers and growers and things like that, but knowing that we have resources through our land grant institutions as well, as well, you know, thanks for everybody who shared resources in the chat um, on the topics. So this is why this network exists. It's so we can share with each other and, and grow together. Um, so I do want to thank all of our panelists, Dana, Ben, Jess, it's been great that you took the time to answer these questions. And thank you for the participants, everybody on today, whether you, you listened and soaked it all in, asked questions, shared resources, it made for a really, really nice discussion. Um, you know, this, this is an ongoing conversation. There's more to talk about. So feel free to connect with people offline and at our monthly meetings. I'll invite the panelists to drop contact information um, in the chat or your name and name of your farm if you're interested, use that um, if you'd like. And then also I will throw in um, one more time in the chat some of the announcements that I did at the very beginning. I'll do that right now. So both where you can find this recording on the offer website when our next meeting is February 2nd and information on joining as well as the workshop, the in-person workshop, which we're super duper excited about, um, that's going to be in February on the first day of the OFA conference, the 16th of February. There is registration information um, in there of how to register for that workshop. Again, I just wanna highlight, it is a separate registration from the OFA conference registration. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, and have an excellent rest of the day. Hope to see you next month.